you might be thinking, how does branding, CBD, entertainment, and organic farming converge? Well, we're going to dive in and you're going to find out. This episode is the convergence of all of those incredible places. Christy Tarleton joins in the com. Christy shares her story of unexpected life journeys and letting passions evolve into stunning creation, art, and lifestyle. She's a creative and marketing director, entrepreneur, biodynamic farmer, and the founder of multiple brands, showing us that the world really is our playground when we open our hearts and our minds to what's possible. We get to create the lifestyle and businesses of our dreams when we dive deep into our passions and values and let our unique magic unfold. In this episode, we dive into how Christy built all of her many organic brands, her understanding of biodynamics and moon cycle gardening, and how the overuse of chemicals and hustle culture are destroying our growth, our magic, our potential in gardening, life, and in our brands. Join us in this beautiful conversation of trust, discovery, and everything CBD you've ever wanted to know. Let's dive in. Welcome to In The Calm. I'm your host, Georgiana Alexander. Welcome. So excited to have you on today. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to dive into conversation with you. Before we dive in, you're an entrepreneur, a mom, you're a biodynamic farmer, which is so incredibly cool. And you are also a creative and marketing director. You have these amazing brands, which are gorgeous, Canvas, The Farmer's Florist, Yuyo Botanics, and you're also the head of Cultivate Tennessee, promoting advocacy. You've been featured in publications like Vogue and Owl Shape, Well and Good, Grazia UK, and you've also gotten the National Next Awards by Amazon. I mean, you are so badass. I knew it when I met you. We totally clicked. But the more I was diving into your work, I'm just like, Hello, badass business babe mama. Oh my God. When you say it like that too, like I forget in all the chaos that that's what my resume is sometimes. I don't remember what you're doing all this for. So I really appreciate the recap. That's a really sweet recap. And I really should give myself a little more of a pat on the back. Here's some time. It's really easy to forget our accomplishments, right? Because you're in the middle of the day to day. We get like bogged down by the details. You're a mom with a young baby, so you're like, obviously, you got spit up and food thrown all over you as the regular, and you just forget how amazing you are. I think, I think we all do. It's really important to come back to the things that we've oh done. Well, thanks for lighting my fire, because I definitely needed a reunion. <laughs> <laughs> so anytime, but- anytime. Oh. And then also, just shout out, you've also done Carrie Underwood's artwork, like lately, her I artwork and editorial, and I mean... It was stunning. It was so stunning. I totally I forgot just, about it. You really dug in the depths. Like, I really, I, I can't believe I forgot about that. But that was such a fun collaboration. My actual, my business partner with Yuya Botanics, I met her working on music festivals and she's a creative director as well. So we just like matched together so beautifully. And she invited me to do this Carrie Underwood set and she had the vision and I had the flowers and we just put it together and it was a really fun thing to work on. We've had some very fun little um, creative moments to break off of the cannabis industry and farming sometimes, especially with being in Nashville because that's the beauty of Nashville. Yeah, there's so many different avenues, but then bringing it back to the core of your business of the branding, that aesthetic but also sustainable mindset and biodynamic farming. I mean, it's just so cool. I can't wait to get into that. So now before I ask you a couple of questions, you have to tell us what is your human design and astrology? Do you know your human design? I have no idea. All okay. I know from Scorpio and okay. they about what time I was born. And that's a the best question. Not every time. I'm like, I asked my mom for 20 times a year what time I was born. And she's like, I don't know. I have to find your birth certificate, which we never go and find. Never get to. I'm going to like follow up with this on you, like for you, because you have so many cool business experiences. I'd be really fascinated to see what your human design is and how you're showing up in the world. I mean, obviously you're amazing. So no question there. It's cool. I've done the disc, which was actually, this is really funny because we do this for our job. It was formulated in the BDSM community because there's obviously like people who are leaders and there are people who are like subs. 
And <laughs> I actually never knew that about the tick. I'm, we're learning all kinds of new things. And so it's funny to see because we have a team of about six, seven people. And it's really interesting to see where you reside on the disc. And I'm truly a supporter. Like I, I am an entrepreneur, but it's always nice to have somebody who's kind of the, the leader of that. And I always end up being the supporter if that's ever a curiosity. That's so cool. Because I'll go alongside of anybody. It's a supporter role. And it's kind of hard to balance that sometimes because I find myself being in this entrepreneurial space. But my biggest, like my heart resides in that supporting role. So it's something that either is both a wrestle and integrates at the same time. Because when I find a good partner to partner with, it's exponential and, and I can really help that partner go far. But it's been a while since I've been a solo artist or solo marketer, et cetera, for a while. That's really interesting because you have such a strong vision and personality that that's really cool that you know that about yourself and can can tap into that because I find I'm kind of the opposite of that big vision and kind of leadership mentality. But oftentimes in a lot of the things that I do, I end up coming in and um, getting stuck in the operational weeds when I was doing consulting and things like that and have to then readjust and pull myself back out of that. But that's really, really powerful that you've been able to learn that early on in your business. No wonder you're finding great things to be a part of because of, of that knowing. Totally. And I, I think just something to also question too, because I think about this often as well, is when you do take these tests, there are also this, this kind of, there's like kind of a layer of your life experience. that I always wonder if it dictates that. Because if you didn't have your life experiences, maybe I've got myself in a supporter role because of the personalities I've experienced in life. Mm-hmm. And so... I always wonder because it, it's interesting. You you almost kind of bring it to the surface of being like, well, you do have this leadership and you have this vision and you have this strong thing. And so I always reconsider trying to take it over and over again. And I'm like, I don't know if I'm supposed to be here, but I'd be really curious about the lag design because I think that might answer more questions for me. We're going to talk about that. There are actually people that can help you. I mean, A, it sounds like you have a birth certificate. I got it from where I was born. <laughs> got it. You know, it's there and... I'm going to help you. I've got some resources that can help you get the information or think about. So we'll talk about that later. Okay. Yeah, that's amazing. So now kind of getting into the conversation, I really, as we start, because the whole undertone of your business really is sustainability. And I love that you're so passionate about agribusiness and buying dynamics. Where did that start for you? It really started with, I think, the way that I was raised. Grew up with horses my whole life. I grew up on four acres, which isn't a ton, but, you know, as a kid, that's a lot of land. Yeah. And I spent a lot of time outside just kind of like climbing the trees, eating cherries in the trees, making tree forts. And I think that was a really great, comfortable place for me as a child. And then when I got into the world of like needing to go to school, finding a job, et cetera, um, the thing that kind of really honed me back into ag was, I think the first thing was a job at a flower shop. And so when I got to play around with textures and colors and just really start to appreciate the types of flowers and then to nerd out and experience like the other types of flowers that are out there, that the ones that you can kind of only get from like a small farmer, it opened up my eyes to what the opportunities of ag could be. And through a series of events, I'm sure we can kind of get into it. I found myself in a, in a pretty deep depression after moving to New York. And I was trying to find the fundamentals of myself and get back to like, okay, what's going to make me happy? I've searched for a career this whole time. I've been in and out of music industry and creative development, et cetera. It was like getting my hands in the dirt. And I went back home and I was just like being with the horses and being with the large animals Mm -hmm. and gardening in the garden and weeding the weeds. It was like that tangibility of putting your body back on earth. It's grounding. It's like people, you know, tend they have to take their shoes off to put their feet on the ground. It was me physically and mentally grounding myself. So I started to search out paths that could take me down that route to kind of help heal my mind and my body and my soul. And it actually, my biggest comfort zone was large animals growing up with horses my whole life. And I actually got connected to a farm here in Tennessee called Bear Creek Farm. And they're actually one of the biggest providers of beef in kind of the restaurant industry here. They also raise pork. And I believe that's it. So they gave me the biggest opportunity and just allowing me to learn the entire way. And the reason I found myself in that space is because I was like, okay, 
I want to be an environmentally conscious person. I already, I own that I eat meat. I'm comfortable with raising animals. I want to be the person that can raise the animals to the highest standard to be able to make people feel comfortable about where they source their meat from. Mm-hmm. But I just like totally opened the doors wide open for me. I was able to like get in car parts, drive tractors, like drive big trucks. Mm-hmm. Weirdly enough, I worked in a processing plant, so like a slaughterhouse, and was just able to be a part of the bigger process. And I just fell in love with the opportunities that happen in farming because you have so many ways of changing how you eat how you interact with the world, how you take care of animals, how you kind of tell a story to be able to make things so much more meaningful at the end of the day, what's on your plates, how you interact with things, how you grow your own garden. So it kind of started from there. That's a really condensed down version because the journey was much more wild in between all of that. Yeah. There's like so many key points that I want to circle back on actually from from that. I mean, it's so beautiful what you're talking about wanting to be a part of the journey of an animal's birth. And then, you know, I think that's the hardest thing for those of us. Like I haven't eaten meat in a long time, but it's not that I don't understand the value to our bodies and what our bodies need, especially different blood types and different health needs, right? Mm -hmm. But it's the way that they're treated is what was lacking for me. And so you are really closing that gap and bringing honor back into the lives and the cycle of life with the animals that you nurture and raise and then have a circle of life and gratitude for these animals and their journey. And that's so beautiful. I actually just heard someone speak about this recently and go into depth about how much it healed her when she began raising cattle and then from going from not meat eating into raising cattle and then recognizing what that life and lifestyle needed and how complete it is for the animal and the humans that are eating it when it's done in respect and in consciousness. Absolutely. And it has its ups and downs and it has its own emotional roller coaster, but it also brings this realness to life that you're leading every day. Like when I had a flock of sheep, I'd have, you know, lambing season and some seasons were better than others. And you have little lambs that didn't make it. And it's just the emotional roller coaster that was there, but it just gave me this tangibility of life and put in perspective for myself. And like you experience life and death every day. And that is a lot deeper of a conversation because that is something I've also really tried to dig into, especially with the experiences that I've had around death and really trying to not be afraid of it. Oh my gosh, I'm sorry. We're going so deep. Let's go go deep deep here. Yeah. (laughs) We're going deep here. Yeah. And I was talking to that speaking so that I can face my fears in a way too, so that I know that you know, maybe we all have some kind of underlying fear that like the world's going to go to hell in a handbasket for us. But like at this point in time in my life, I now feel pretty confident that if the the world was to socially collapse, I could find ways to take care of my family and would know how to carry lifestyles forward as much as possible. Now, that may not have been my original intention, but I think just facing life straight on in those instances really helped me deal with that depression and fear Mm -hmm. too. That is really powerful that you were able to circle back into that for yourself and really hone in on what it was that you were needing. That was the other point of your story I wanted to kind of touch in on was how you did go to New York and you did get into all of these industries of fashion and creative and entertainment. And I think it's really something so interesting for so many of us. We have this idea of what creative success looks like, and it usually taps into LA, New York, or major cities, right? Where we're fully disconnected from, in most cases, nature and grounding and the things like that that really support our sensitive souls. And so I love how you've been able to say, this is my core, you know, at the core, Mm -hmm. the earth was where I started. It's what really matters most to me. But yet you've been able to really establish and grow yourself creatively and entrepreneur wise and and have all these amazing experiences. Like we just talked about the places you've been featured and really, you know, this ties in perfectly to where we're headed with your branding, which I'm obsessed with. We talk about that we're both hardcore geek out on branding and marketing, and I'm completely obsessed with all of your brand aesthetic and just seeing that tied in with agribusiness, with sustainability. I just love that you're like, I'm not going to give up on it looking so juicy and good. And just, you know, that whole brand package 
of a major company, a major established company. You're like, we're going as high as we can go with the way that this looks and the packaging and the whole vibe of each of the different brands that you are a founder and co-founder with. And yet it really circles back to your core value of, and it's going to be sustainable and it's going to be connected to my heart and soul. We, we talk a little bit about that. I just love that you were able to find your place and then make it your own. Oh my God. Thank you so much. much. I'll take compliments. Like, look, I see you. I see you. you. (laughs) I think, okay. And I don't know if you did this as a kid because you appreciate this type of branding, but like when I was a child, I would sit with magazines all day long. And and I like, I, I, I would always curate my like space in my brain. And I think that's where it started. And to tie that in, I was a, like, I, I did horrible in school. And like the only things I ever thrived in were like the creative spaces. So like photography class, art class, actually environmental history class. I did really great. It was the only one I ever <laughs> really went to for AP, which is very interesting, environmental sciences. So it's interesting to see that reflection. I never really thought about that before. But I've always wanted to curate the spaces around me. So I already have this, maybe it's like a little rooted in OCD. So I also had a weird obsession with Martha Stewart, who is like, the goddess of the crossover of design and agriculture. And so I think I found this like home in that space because my grandma and grandpa always had a garden and I really appreciate design. My dad really has a huge eye for aesthetics. My mom's always dreaming about her perfect house. And so having, you know, Martha Stewart as somebody that I looked up to as a child, which is a really interesting child's hero, essentially, was having the agriculture and the style put together And it just was something that I felt comfortable with. And I really liked curating my own spaces, especially with like my room. And I would always have, I would repaint my room and I would rearrange my Mm -hmm. room. All kind of started. Yeah, it was weird. Yeah. Still do it. Like my house is not safe ever from me (laughs) rearranging. And then as far, I'm always, I'm kind of like a, I like to call myself like maybe an experience junkie because I wasn't thriving in school and I never really knew where I wanted to go. So I was like, okay, well, maybe if I rack up these certain experiences and these certain accolades, I could maybe find my past. I had a moment of spirituality. It was like kind of pretty ingrained in the Christian church for a while. And I was like, okay, well, I'm going to let the spirit lead me in some pathway to where I need to go because I have nothing that's coming to my brain of like what I'm massively passionate about. And it really isn't until like you know, getting into my mid thirties that I was like owning who I am and what I am truly passionate about. But that's why I find myself with such a crazy resume of things from the music business, from branding, from going to school at Parsons in New York city, from having a, you know, a farming apprenticeship. I've racked up these experiences to try to find where my soul resides. Cause I keep following my soul, which is maybe a good or bad thing. I think it's, it's never- a good thing. Yeah. It sounds, sounds pretty good. It sounds like it's working for you. It's been a fun journey. It's not always super fun financially because you're like, I have no idea where I'm going to get my next paycheck from. But there is a little bit of comfort when you do own your own business to be able to constantly make things happen and you can always pivot. I love that Martha Stewart was like your guru <laughs> because she was my guru too. Like I loved entertaining my family did a lot of entertaining and we always always be decorated house like my mom would come home and our house would be a completely different color outside as well where she would just be like oh I painted the outside today because I wanted it white instead of dark and we're like okay (laughs) you know looking for our house going down the street and so it was always that change and that excitement of change I think but again you know same experience that you had maybe that does tie into the organic branding that we both that really, that organic but soul organic branding, you know, that mm-hmm. that really ties and connects to what the soul consciousness is about of a brand, of a person. And I think that's why it's been such a draw for you to connect in with what your soul is wanting versus mm-hmm. just following, you know, whatever excited you next. I mean, it may be, maybe you feel like that looking at it from your point of view, because I know I've had so many experiences all across the board as well. And it really took a while for me to hone in and honor how all the pieces actually connected. And I needed those as building blocks for the things I was really going to settle into. And it sounds like you had a similar experience with that. And so it makes sense, you know, when you're trying to find your way or when you're collecting those those learning pieces that you're going Mm -hmm. to need to hone in, it looks messy, right? And you don't have the answers of where you're going, but you feel it. 
and then you show up there and at the end of it, you're like, oh, I get it. Like it all makes sense now, you know, when we, when we kind of look back, but we don't always have that, that view as we're in the middle of it. So that's really cool. I love that this is your experience with the way that you stepped into your branding and that you were able to still continue to have this connection to the earth in everything that you do. So share a little bit about that as you were building your brands and bringing this onto the market, how that felt for you. Because I think people, you know, a lot of people are starting entrepreneurs and they're looking for their brand voice or their aesthetic. And so much of the messaging that we get is that we have to be disconnected. Like it has to look like this. And mm -hmm. maybe our heart or our soul are really yearning for it to be something different. Mm -hmm. Well, back to the Martha Stewart thing really quickly, because you know what's really fascinating about her being an idol is that like, if you follow her trajectory, like now she's a weed queen. So I'm like, <laughs> how funny is that, that I've like bounced along with Funny. her the entire time. Now Martha Stewart's not why I'm in cannabis, but it really helps because I'm like, oh, I'm affirmed. Like, <laughs> I'm affirmed yes. that I can be all these things and I can enjoy weed gummies. Yeah. Love it. Uh, That's amazing, actually. <laughs> well, as far as the journey goes, it is very interesting to look back and think about all of the experiences because I think it has equipped me very well to be able to hone in and maybe meet a person where their story is at because I can really relate to them and where they, they've gone in their experience. And also really helped me identify myself and the things that I like before I start to go into branding. And the other biggest component is storytelling. And with agriculture and with organic, the thing is, is it's a hard story to tell and it's a hard thing to sell. And so the other portion of that, it is unfortunate in some cases that organic food is and the experience is a luxury experience. In order to make a massive impact in this world, you kind of have to have money behind it. And so the way to make it be most paid attention to is by following that path of the farm to table movement and mm -hmm. farmers markets and creating experiences around it. And so you bring those thought leaders and the people that have the financial and political backing to these experiences, you might have the ability to change things quite a bit more. So I wanted to put it into a perspective that people could really appreciate and be more drawn to, even if they weren't necessarily down to like get their hands super dirty. Because not everybody has that hole in their heart, right? They don't necessarily love to sweat their butt off and be covered in dirt and work from sunup to sundown. Like that's not romantic. Farm is super hard. But when you bring the beauty of it to the surface, because there are so many beautiful and mindful moments in it, I think that's where you can start to captivate people and be like, no, this is super important. What you put in your body is super important. Now I'm wooing you to come into the space by feeling comfortable. That's the other thing. Branding makes somebody comfortable because if they can identify with it and they also feel um, a spark from it, it makes them feel much more inclined to try it and like it's trustworthy. And just I a quick, a quick like interject there. I think that it's interesting because I think that what makes people feel comfortable with branding is when, especially when it's small businesses or a new entrepreneurial venture where it really is a solo entrepreneur building, when it comes from someone's heart and passion, like they really light up and believe in what they're doing. I think that is hugely magnetic. It is. And I think you can kind of feel someone's like soul and their vibration and their passion in it. Because as you and I connected, I think the heart that was behind the conversations we were having is what made you reach is what made us reach out to each other together. Right. And I think the only way to make businesses super successful is by creating that personal connection. So I try my best to bring that personal connection into everything we create and do while still like, of course I want anything to be in my house to like be beautiful. Right. So it's like, if I had a cereal box, I'd love for that cereal box to be beautiful. I'm more inclined for that cereal box. So my countertop, uh, if it is beautiful, but it's having that vibration because you can't necessarily cultivate that through a visual, but I think storytelling is such a big piece too, because the language that you use, the education that you share, that creates a little bit more of a personal experience into where someone feels way more comfortable with the brand itself. Absolutely. I mean, you and you've just mastered that as well. I mean, I just got so lost in all of your different worlds as I went from brand to brand. It was just so beautiful 
as a brand geek, I was just in heaven as well mm -hmm. as then I was really captivated to understand and learn more about, especially, you know, with Canvas, the CBD and things like that. I, I know a little, not a lot. And I'm really excited to talk about all of that with you as well, because I know our listeners, this community, it's like everyone wants resources for their health and wellness. But sometimes it, a lot of the information, I feel like it just gets lost, that the translation gets lost a little bit. And you don't really know you're getting mixed messages about, well, this is what to look for. This isn't what to look for. And I just feel like your messaging was so clear and it mm -hmm. made it accessible and really fun to kind of jump in and play around. And it was beautiful. So you've obviously nailed it. And we could just go on a deep dive in a whole other episode about branding and just geek out hard. I know. So <laughs> but I'm going to save everybody listening. We'll, we'll do that another time. <laughs> but I do want to get into, uh, before we dive into the CBD, I really want to let you speak to the biodynamic farming. We had a really cool conversation off camera before we jumped on about how beautiful biodynamic farming is, but really then giving people tools and accessibility to what might be more in their price range. Well, you want to share a little bit more about biodynamic farming, what you do with that, and then also accessibility? Okay. So the passion in biodynamic farming really arose from my husband. The journey I was on, I was learning about organic, sustainable, all those hype words, regenerative, et cetera. What brought the magic I was looking for in farming together was biodynamic. The reason I was introduced to biodynamics with my husband was biodynamically farming out in California and Oregon and was introduced to this concept actually through cannabis growers because there's just people out in California that are just so much more in tune with the earth and the space that they're living in and, and, and the intentionality that they bring to it. And it's kind of like the woo-woo sister of farming because biodynamics is really based on how plants interact with the solar system and the universe. And so the best way to say it is by referring back to how the moon moves the tides. Now I'm going to bash this because my husband is the one that this is, his, this is his wheelhouse. Yeah. Okay. This is his wheelhouse. For sure. <laughs> he, it is, it is a study. Like he actually, um, mentored under Jeff Poppin, who's the barefoot farmer. So if you're ever interested in getting to a foundation of biodynamic, Rudolf Steiner is the man who created it. And there's a whole theory of life around biodynamics. It's not just in agriculture, but it was this particular portion that people really pulled out and, and found a lot of great success in farming when there's lack of water, not the best soil, and how to get back to how the earth really interacts or needs certain things to be able to produce really good food and healthy food. Jeff Poppin is the barefoot farmer. You wrote a book. He's here in Tennessee. He was his mentor. And so it is a whole study. I wish I could go super into biodynamics as far as how it works, but I just thought it was so cool when my husband was planting what my flower seeds based upon the moon cycles. And he was really right with the fact that there are certain phases within the moon where like root vegetables thrive more, leaf vegetables thrive more, Plants that produce flowers thrive more. And so there's a calendar that you follow that's based upon the cycle of the universe to really help bring more magic into your soil and into your plants. And it's also something that we never really talk about is the magic that happens underneath the soil. The greatest concept that I ever really was able to absorb was how the redwoods up in California, Northern yeah. California, they have this like ecosystem in their roots where they're able to talk to each other through like the fungi and all the little myceliums and all of the little creatures that are in the soil to be able to give each other nutrients for that, for their communities to survive. And so there's already this like foundational magic that we don't even tap into. So when we go into conventional ag, we destroy that magic because we put on post-World War II chemicals onto our plants in order for them to thrive, mm -hmm. kill the biodiversity in our soil specifically. We kill the biodiversity by doing monocropping. So you, you lose a lot of that magic in just the way that we've been conventionally farming. Now, there's a multitude of ways that you can go about regenerating that. That's what, where regenerative ag comes in. Permaculture is one it's like where you utilize the benefits of the space that you're already in to try to revitalize the natural habitat that was there 
And then the plants that are native to that area, you can actually like feed off of, which is a really great concept. So we get so deep into it. But I think what made me really understand the importance of this, especially with organic food, because that's the most accessible, was hemp and cannabis. Mm. When I learned more about cannabis and how it interacted with the soil underneath it, I really started to understand the importance of organic food. Now, cannabis is called a bioremediator, which means it sucks up all the toxins out of the soil around it. So it has the ability to actually clean the soil around you. That's another reason why farmers here in Tennessee would plant it is to essentially clean up their soil from conventional farming to transition to transition it to organic farming. What was also fascinating about that was as hemp became a part of the ecosystem here in Tennessee, it became required to test it. So testing it for heavy metals and pesticides because it was a bioremediator. So when you started to have that conversation of why we would test this plant when you ingest it for those particular things, we don't even necessarily test our food at these standards. So it brought this like new sound understanding of like, oh my God, we really have no idea what's in our food. And I hate to be that person that's like, it's true. Rod. Yeah, I, true. I hate to be that person because girls still go to Kroger. I still, and I'll get unconventional and I'll go to, to Target sometimes and buy groceries and I don't always buy organic. It just happens. This is the ecosystem I'm in and I submit in some way. It just makes you realize like how important organic can be to our ecosystem, how important biodynamic can be to our ecosystem. The biodynamic part that became such a, we're such an advocate for it. It's just to bring that connection of the higher up to the lower you know, to the down below together, because we're not just living in this like microcosm. We don't live in a bubble. We live in the universe on this, like my husband always likes to say a rocket ship that's flying through space. You're part of space. So biodynamic brings the two together, the spiritual and the reality. I don't know. The dirt realm is what I would call it. And I think what's really cool is you start to see, and this is where that's also a really interesting conversation. Biodynamics is more predominantly found in wine culture. Which again, that's where that, I heard it most, most yeah. times, but I'm hearing more and more about farming, the farming. And totally. Which kind of puts it in this luxury realm. Right. And it's like, it only thrives there because it's an experience and it's something new and they brand it beautifully. And it's like, it's interesting, but it hasn't really expanded out into other spaces for some reason. I would love to see biodynamics thrive much more, but it is pretty complicated for you to, to farm biodynamically. Some of those actually key pieces include preps, which are like utilizing silica and burying a horn with silica in your backyard so that it ferments. It's like basically taking chemistry and applying it to what your your plants need um, based upon like the items that are around you. So some that you would typically find on your own farm. The concept of biodynamic too is like in an ideal world, everything that you have on your farm or what you need on your farm comes from your farm. So having the animals be part of the ecosystem, in our case, we have sheep, so they eat the grass, they poop out nutrients, you get the nitrogen fixation, you grow clover, you till that into the ground to kind of help the soil on the ecosystem. But that's not always necessarily accessible for farmers. That's the other thing. It's like a lot of the inputs that you need to put on your farm to create it into a biodynamic ecosystem actually have to come from off your farm. So financially, you have to bring it. sustainable financially. Totally. Until you've built that ecosystem mm-hmm. for biodynamics, because that just doesn't exist in our world, and, you know, today. So we're not like roaming out with pastures of sheep. And it is interesting. I've had like I, I love biodynamic microgreens mm-hmm. that I've found recently, and you really can taste the difference. I mean, I I have a, a sensitive palate, and I can really taste the quality of food that I eat. You know, it's something mm-hmm. that is distinct, but it's not always available, and it's not available in every market and around each person. But I think it is an interesting conversation, just like when, I mean, you know, we go back 10, 15, 20 years ago, and the term organic was so, you know, kind of like in this whole other circle. It was very much outside of mainstream living, and now it's everywhere. And we know it's not, that doesn't mean that you're always getting the highest quality of something. Now it can be a marketing term that's kind of tossed around, but really to have, you know, the same thing with yoga, how no one really had ever heard of yoga. And now it's everywhere, you know, in every corner, Starbucks, that kind of thing, like Mm -hmm. yoga and Starbucks. So I think it is interesting to bring this into conversation, into, you know, the language of what we're looking at. And I love how 
it really represents, just as you were saying, with growing animals for slaughter to then eat, it really brings us back to our root as humans, back to the mm -hmm. earth, back to the cycles with nature that we are a part of intuitively and in walking the ground. And I think with a lot of, as you said, post-war is when a lot of our farming, a lot of our chemical and, you know, plastics and things like that, these were all birthed from that. Absolutely. And none of them were birthed from a place of our well-being. And so it's so crucial to really go back to that place as we hit highs with, you know, mental health and depression. And we wonder why. And I think just as you were talking about earlier, reaching a point where you were disconnected from the core of who you are in pursuit of a life that quote unquote looked like what you thought it needed to be in environments that needed to be, and then bringing yourself back to that core system changed everything for you and really opened a lot of doors. And I think that the same is true for our foods. Mm -hmm. For sure. And I think all of those things were born out of the need for efficiencies. Now, I don't want to say like farming with plastic actually creates a lot of efficiencies. Right. Like, and it allows people to feed more people and allows people to have more access to certain foods. And you know, medical food. devices and things exactly. that they did not have before. For sure. And so it's hard because I really wrestle. I'm like, I understand that this had to happen because I don't want to tell somebody like, shouldn't use plastic. You shouldn't do that. Like I've definitely used plastic in our, in some of our <laughs> situations, right? Like we have hoop houses. You actually have to cover that with plastic in order for it to keep warm all winter. And so I think, do you remember when the slow movement was happening? It was really diving mm -hmm. in on Instagram. And I think that's where, that was like this moment where I started to really understand biodynamics and get back to that slow, like lifestyle understanding the craft of things. Like I really loved watching my grandmother, you know, cook a meal, watching my grandfather grow beads in his garden. It really, those were their luxuries. And it, it, there was something I just kept trying to sign and go back to. And it's like, yes, we have all these efficiencies that like us as humans, prior to all this consumerism, prior to the fact that I have to sit on my computer all the time and be on Slack and, and whatever, there were these slow moments in life that helped you really absorb life as it was around you slow time down. I kind of always go, that goes back a lot to like my processing of death too. And I'm very mindful about like trying to make my time really matter and count. Mm -hmm. I think that's why organic and biodynamic is so romantic to me is because it, it forces you to slow down and think about the magic that actually exists under your feet. Right. I was just listening to a podcast about the, I think it's like the thousand things of happiness or the thousand days of happiness. And it's really just finding those little moments in everyday life that allow you to just recognize how magical this world is and to mm -hmm. not forget that the fact that we're even here is like phenomenal. Like it's the miracle. fact that our chemical process happened, that I became here and I like the things that I like and I am where I am is astounding in itself. And I think if we can try to remember that on a daily basis, that helps us get back to the fundamental, just the, our core being. Yeah. Back to your little commentary about the the, the biodynamic microgreens. I think when people pay attention so closely to the soil, you're going to get such a crazy outcome because you are paying attention to the minerals and the nutrients that make that vegetable. And that's what makes those vegetables just so much more delicious because exactly. it has what it actually needs to create itself. And your body can actually feel that when you when you slow down and when you tune into that, right? And and I think we're all craving an element of that. We're looking so much in our lives for these ways to slow down or, you know, it's such a trend on TikTok and Instagram to talk about how you spend your day or the rituals and things like that. And I think with that, it really shows to me that there's a yearning for a deeper connection to our day-to-day, -to, -day, to our, our sun cycles, which is so important. I was just talking to a friend who healed her life completely her health and wellness, which was pretty dire from resetting her sun cycles and waking with the sun and going to sleep mm -hmm. and as the sun went down and her water and things like that. And so, of course, it makes sense that our food is such a huge part of that too. Absolutely. Absolutely. This is where the cannabis conversation connects because Cannabis has the capability to help you find your sleep cycle, to help you find your balance and a moment of relaxation versus just getting high. Like that is the conversation I'm super, super excited about. 
when we talk about our soil missing all sorts of nutrients, that doesn't mean it, that also includes our bodies are missing all sorts of nutrients. Mm-hmm. And so you think about prior to prohibition, when c- cannabis is a plant, which means cannabis grew everywhere and anywhere. It's a weed, literally. And cattle used to be able to graze on it. We used to have it in our ecosystem. People used to eat it. It is just, it has, uh, I think, the same amount of vitamin K. It's like percentage. We have a system called the endocannabinoid system that is basically in balance because we aren't getting cannabinoids in our system on a day-to-day basis, with the exception of somebody like me. Uh, <laughs> but there is that foundational building block. Like cannabinoids are even found in breast milk, which is a really fascinating conversation because it's helping to build your child's brain as your child is, is growing. And so when you start to think about the pieces that we're missing in our own bodies and how to replenish those, cannabis is a great conversation to have to try to help people get back back to that homeostasis, which is what we're really looking for ultimately. I love that. Let's go deeper because I feel like there's so many questions around cannabis, around CPD, around, you know, when should I take it? How? And aside from, you know, obviously people are doing it for social engagement, things like that, but really the people that are looking for solutions for health and wellness or maybe just super unfamiliar with any conversation around cannabis other than weed and smoking weed, you know, help walk us through a little bit more of a relationship with CBD and cannabis. For sure. So highly encourage anybody to just Google the endocannabinoid system. It was found somewhat recently. I want to say the 80s. Please don't pull me to that. Um, (laughs) It was pretty mind-blowing because we haven't really known about it in our bodies, we don't even know, like, we're just, we're still learning about things in our own bodies. And we've lived with ourselves for what, like 10,000, 12,000, 20,000 years. Yeah. It's amazing. Um, I mean, side note, we just realized about the fascia system not long ago, because I mean, which is insane. It's such a huge part of our bodies, but we didn't know because everyone was only looking at dead bodies when they were checking into this fascia. Right. right. Yeah. Oh, I'd love to hear that one. So how it works, your endocannabinoid system has receptors, primarily CB1 and CB2. Now, those deal with certain neurological functions. One of them specifically in deals with inflammation. We always talk about how inflammation, I'm sure in the conversation that you have, inflammation is a precursor to a lot of the diseases that we experience. Something else that I found that was really, really interesting too, as I dove into learning more about the endocannabinoid system, is that neurodegenerative diseases that are within the endocannabinoid system, which include Huntington's disease, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and multiple sclerosis, so MS, those are all heavily treated with cannabis. And so it already kind of tells you how integrated our bodies are with cannabis. So cannabis has a function in all sorts of ways. It can help relieve anxiety. It can help with kind of calming your brain and de-stressing your mind. It can help with inflammation and pain, which is why CBD had such a big explosive moment when it became available. And it can also help with sleep as well. So when hemp came around due to the federal farm bill, it allowed other cannabinoids to be focused on because what delineates hemp from marijuana, it's all cannabis. But what delineates the two is that marijuana has a higher concentration of delta-9 THC in the plant. And cannabis has a higher concentration of either CBG, CBN, CBC, CBD. Those are all minor cannabinoids. And All the minor cannabinoids have their own role in your body on how they kind of play with your system. So CBG, it's the mother cannabinoid and really helps with appetite and focus and stress. And then CBD really helps with inflammation specifically. And so it's really hard to be able to rattle off all of them to you because there's over 180 different cannabinoids that are found in the cannabis plant. And so overall, when you're starting to have a conversation with somebody about cannabis. Hemp is cannabis. Think about a tomato plant, right? I always say like when I'm gardening, I've got tomatoes that are ranging in this like little tiny golden sun golds that are like super sweet in taste and really juicy. And then you can go all the way to these heirloom varieties that are like big purple kind of savory in flavor. And that's the same thing. You have all these different genetics within one variety of a plant. So that's how we're able to actually have products that exist that are legal because 
the federal farm bill only measures Delta 9 THC. And Delta 9 THC is that compound that everyone's so well attuned to think, you know, that's the one that technically gets you high. It also has its own incredible qualities that I wouldn't really want to list out because the FDA doesn't love you talking about. (laughs) But it really, there's a lot of studies to show, especially for those neurodegenerative diseases like MS, cannabis really helps the side effects of those to help people beat it or to find themselves in a better state of life when they do have those degenerative diseases. That's amazing. I think there's so much medicine and wisdom in our plants, in, in so many of our plants, right? And then again, going back to the earth and the and the moon cycles and the sun cycles. But I mean, as you're talking, it sounds like every ailment that we have in our modern culture really comes back to our plants and our minerals and the way that we're, I mean, like, you know. Yeah. Really, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, I had this thought I was driving the other day and I don't know what set me up, but it's probably... <laughs> It's really just, I don't know. but anyway, <laughs> we have what we need already on this earth. Like, mm. Valium is made from valerian and like other pharmaceutical drugs. There's been a lot of Instagrams or reels that you've seen out there, and not saying that like, those are the only sources that you get it from. But a lot of our pharmaceutical plant or pharmaceuticals are made from mm. synthesization of plants. So, usually go out to the rainforest, find what you need, you synthesize it and you put it into a pharmaceutical. And yes, we have the chemical processes of creating other chemicals, but those chemicals exist on this earth already more than likely in a lot of plants and compounds and minerals that we have on this earth. That's another thing that we really like to do with some of our products for Canvas and and Yuyo. But for Canvas, we use L-theanine in conjunction with CBN. And L-theanine is a um, compound that's a mineral that's actually found from green tea. So it's like you can pair these plants together to get a greater outcome. It's already synergistically working because your cure essentially lives on this earth. Now our the bane of our existence also lives on this earth because of the chemicals that we produce, et cetera, and things are poisonous. Right. So it's like a beautiful balance. But, but I would think, that, think. Oh, sorry, go ahead. It's okay. I was just saying it's fascinating to think that like we already have everything that we essentially need going back to biodynamics, everything that you already need on your farm, putting it back into the soil so that Mm. it it heals itself. It can be at its highest performance of how it should be and should have been. And I really think it's interesting to speak to that. A lot of times with the pharmaceuticals, there are so many reactions and then you have to compound and take this pharmaceutical for another pharmaceutical. And, you know, there's so many great uses for our pharmaceuticals, so I don't want to discredit how many lives have been saved. But then with the misuse of pharmaceuticals, how many lives have been detrimented and their their health has really been destroyed in a lot of cases. I mean, I've seen that with a, a number of people and even in my own life, you know, being over prescribed certain medications and antibiotics and things like that, where it was a 10 year journey for me to reclaim my health. After Absolutely. that, maybe. And Absolutely. so with a lot of these natural components where it is what pharmaceuticals are synthesizing from, we can take them with probably a lot less likelihood of having that detriment to our health because it's natural and it's created in a way that's meant for us to be able to utilize, I would think. Of course. And back to the pharmaceutical conversation, I think one of the greatest responses we get to our products is the sleep one. It's like, mm-hmm. I took BN, I no longer take Ambien. Like an ambient makes you feel funny. Like in order to have something that you can take that can help you find the REM cycle that you actually need for true rest without feeling the repercussions in the morning can be cannabis. And that can replace some of these pharmaceuticals. So back to the conversation too about the political activism part, there is a lot of lobbying, I believe, against cannabis because it has the potential to replace a lot of pharmaceuticals for people. Again, yeah. not knocking down pharmaceuticals for people who absolutely need them. There are, I have migraines. I take it. I take a prescription for them often not in conjunction with cannabis when it works and doesn't work. Now, cannabis isn't necessarily, it's not a rescuer for all. And that's a really interesting part about your endocannabinoid system. So some people are more depleted than others. Some people feel it more than others. It just depends on how your body works. It's like same with our metabolisms, right? My metabolism might be really slow. Your metabolism might be really fast. The way that you're allergic to foods is different than me. The way that you thrive on certain foods is different than me. And so the thing that I think is really cool is because there's all these variations in cannabis that there have 
then starts those studies to find certain cannabis cultivars that work specifically with your body. So those ratios of CBN and CBG and deltas and THC, et cetera, so that you can find the right thing that works for you. But we are light years from that. I can't wait for it. That's going to be exciting because I have a, a pretty sensitive nature. Like I react differently than maybe the norm, right? I'm just sensitive to things. So it's always, I have to be careful when I'm trying new products, but I love that you speak to that. So for someone like me, who maybe is sensitive or has food rea- reactions and things like that, mm-hmm. how would you suggest, like what questions should I ask? What things should I look for in my products? Where should I start that would be a great testing point to see how my body is reacting. What do you recommend for people that are kind of just dipping their toes in? I think first and foremost, it can get really stressful when you're looking at cannabis products because it almost feels like you're really can. into an untrustworthy <laughs> space because there are so many people in the space. And the thing that what what makes it like that is like when the federal farm bill passed, it opened up a world of opportunity for people and people were like, all right, this is my end to cannabis. It also opened up an opportunity of business. Therefore, you're going to have a lot of different products out there that probably that have fillers, that have ingredients that don't necessarily need to be there, that aren't using the highest quality ingredients, et cetera, that aren't extracting. Extraction is also a really great conversation to have that we can totally have in another one because it is a yeah. long conversation about methodology of extraction. I think the biggest part is brands do a really good job and this is where branding comes in. You can kind of, I would say more often than not, when you look at a brand and you see the way that they portray themselves, whether they're trustworthy or not, maybe that's just me because I can like, and I can see the story that they're telling. Mm-hmm. But if you resonate with a brand, I think that really helps your comfort level and knowing like what they are actually about. And then the other thing is reading the ingredient list can immediately tell you, you know, if you see stuff that's just like a filler, unfortunately, I can't rattle off exactly what fillers those are, like like a soy filler, right? Soy was actually got a lot in in CBD products when the market first started because people were trying to figure out the edibles and those um, components in order to make them shelf stable, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And a lot of this R&D has had to happen, which is allowed to get us to the place of where we are with making really clean edibles or really clean um, consumables or smokables. The other thing is that I will harp on is called a COA, Certificate of Analysis, which allows you to understand the trustworthy, like to trust the quality of the plants that are going in. And so it is actually required now specifically by law in the state of Tennessee, and a lot of other states are passing this law as well, that you require a certificate of analysis to be able to put a product on the shelf. Now, what that does is it tells you that the plant was grown in a clean environment, so it doesn't have residual pesticides or heavy metals because when you either smoke or ingest those, because they are at such a high concentration, they could be more harmful than not. If you were ingesting a plant that wasn't necessarily clean. So a certificate of analysis really is that door that opens up a saying like, hey, I'm being transparent here. This is where we get it from. This is what it's got, what the levels are. This is the cannabinoid content in it. A company should always have their certificates of analysis or COAs on their website to be able to help you understand how transparent and clean that product is. And that really only goes for the actual cannabis in the products. The COA is based upon the actual cannabinoids and the hemp derived. I love that you're really bringing this part of the conversation to light because I did do some work in the nutraceuticals. It's been ages ago now, but sitting at these tables with scientists and, you know, sourcing different products that are making our vitamins with some, I was sitting at the tables with some pretty major vitamin manufacturers Mm -hmm. and seeing at times where, I mean, there's some really amazing producers out there and then there are some not so great ones. And as you said, there's often a lot of fillers or there's a lot of combination of things that maybe look good to a marketing team, but aren't necessarily for your benefit and Mm -hmm. actually just create kind of friction in the system and resistance to the body. And so having that experience firsthand, it really taught me to be very aware going into like buying my vitamins. And Mm -hmm. for everyone listening, I mean, again, we talk a lot about tuning into your body. If you just slow down and, you know, whether it's an online product or whether you're on a store aisle and you just think about that product, you can tune into the subtleties within your body and see 
how does this feel to me? And it doesn't necessarily make it wrong, but there could be something in your system that isn't aligned to what you're seeing. You know, for me, if I come across anything with a filler, whether it's a beauty product or any kind of supplement product, I'm very sensitive to what's in those fillers and how they are formulated. And so I look to that to, to recognize how my system is going to react. And although I tend to be like the canary in the mine where, you know, I, I tend to be much more reactive than most people, I think it's a really great way to go back to trusting yourself, to listening to your body. And again, with what you're talking about, I love that there are these resources with the certificate of analysis where you can dive deeper into what is in the products. Now. Absolutely. Yeah. And hold those brands and standards because if they say that there's a certain amount of milligrams in the actual product, then you better believe that COA should say that same amount of milligrams should be in that product. Mm -hmm. There have been definitely bad players in the space, but I mean, it's cannabis. Cannabis has its own experience and reality in this world. And so I think when you try to bring this, one of our core values is actually elevate every experience. And so when you try to bring a level of professionalism into cannabis, it's going to really help detach the stigma that is attached to it because there isn't a lot of professionalism or there hasn't been a lot of professionalism in the past. So there have been people who have said like, oh yeah, this is like a 2000 milligram tincture when in fact it was like 50 milligram. But trying to put in that basic policy so that somebody feels really comfortable with the products that are continuing to get put out there at this time. That really is a great segue into, I would love for you to share about your canvas products like because they're so the names are so cute and I really want to know more about each one I was kind of stalking them on the internet but I want to really dive into that okay cool so we wanted to make the experience super digestible and for you to really understand at what time of day do you take this product so we came up with lifters drifters and shifters so cute so <laughs> are for the morning, can really be all day, but they just kind of help uplift you. You feel a little bit more energized, a little bit more focused. And so in that realm of products, we're focusing primarily on CBG, which is that focus and uplifting mm -hmm. cannabinoid it's CBD, which really helps with like anxiety and inflammation to help you really get through the day. The actives or the function forward ingredients that we like to call them in those products include things like yerba mate, and matcha and certain ingredients that really also help boost your energy. Your mate is the traditional Argentinian tea that's drank all day long to kind of help give you energy. It works just like caffeine, but doesn't give you the crash because it's, it's compound matine acts just like caffeine. And then we have drifters, which are for the end of the day to help you like drift off to sleep. And so we focus on the cannabinoids CBN and CB to really help you wind down at the end of the day, calm your mind, but wake up really rejuvenated at, in the morning. Don't love melatonin. I have a really hard time waking up on it. So this is a really great alternative if you have a little bit of a reaction to melatonin. We pair some of our drifters products with L-theanine, which is derived from green tea, but which it seems like a little bit of a, a different experience because you think, oh, green tea is energizing. But it does really help with sleep. And so you'll actually now see L-theanine on the shelves at Whole Foods or I've a lot of I've been seeing it a lot more lately. Yeah, to help specifically with relaxation and um, sleep. Works great in conjunction with magnesium. Then we have shifters, which are to shift your perspective. So we focus on all the THC variations in that, primarily Delta 9. And we do combine it with CBD because the whole plant is better and they work, it works better with your body. And with those, we have, you know, includes things like electrolytes to kind of help with like performance and feeling good all day. Ooh, I love that. Totally. And so there's something for everyone at every time of day. Shifters, I think is really transversible. You can take shifters during the day. If you're like, I love taking shifters when I go on a run. And I think that's the other thing is like, I would love to have a conversation or help and challenge people to explore cannabis in other places other than just having fun with the girls. Like it is a really great alternative to that glass of wine because we are learning that alcohol is actually more detrimental to our body. Yes, wine is good in certain amounts and it has all the different benefits to it. Mm -hmm. I was going to try to use the fancy word. I was like the polyphenols. I can't remember. I'm not going to go there. <laughs> but it can be that alternative option because like I cannot drink a drink to save my life anymore. Like I love a margarita. I, I went the I other day to go get a margarita and I was like, this thing is hit. I had a hangover the next day because I was like, I can't, I can't. So cannabis is definitely my go-to for those good times. But 
The thing that I really love to challenge people is experiencing cannabis because it brings you back to this certain awareness that you are, your senses are a little bit more heightened. You're a little bit more grounded in where you're at. You become slightly more intuitive and like you have better conversations with yourself. It also has the capability to kind of open up your heart a little bit more to yourself. You can enjoy simple things a little bit more like eating a gummy before I weed my garden makes weeding my garden so much fun. <laughs> and I'm like really into the task. And like so you guys sometimes- need that on the website, like makes the crappy task so much more fun. I know. I think I've posted on social media being like, make sure it's like a million times more fun because you better believe I, I can only technically really eat half a gummy for like a good functional dose. We'll get into dosing okay, for a good functional dose. But if I eat a whole gummy, there has been times where like, if I eat a whole gummy, I go home and I clean my entire house like crazy because I'm really into cleaning my space and like regain my space. So it's interesting to see how you can have certain experiences while partaking with cannabis to just make things a little bit more fun, you know, and not to alter your experience always, but I'm just looking to have more fun in life in general. And if that means popping half a gummy before I go on a run, because the colors are a little bit brighter and I'm enjoying this like gorgeous scenery, just a little bit more Hmm. Why not train my brain to remember that I can experience that so that when I'm not necessarily on that, I can remember and go back to that experience and be like, oh, yeah, I was healed by this experience and seeing and smelling this earth and smelling, you know, like and seeing the grass way. So, yeah. I love it. I love it. Okay. So now take us through dosing. Okay. So dosing is absolutely different for everybody. It's really interesting. I am going to fully admit that I am a thousand percent. I love smoking cannabis. I think it, for me, it is one of the most precise ways for me to know exactly how I'm going to feel when I'm going to feel it. Mm -hmm. I can control it a lot more, but that's, it's called the onset and offset effect. So the way that smoking and tinctures, which are called sublinguals and edibles all work, it's very different with your body because of the way that it gets into your blood system. So when you smoke something, your frequencies are different as well. I would imagine. I don't no, oh, I, I mean, know with the God. formation of the, we, we, just so opened, we just opened a door. We opened a portal, actually. The portal. Um, we smoke, the cannabinoids are hitting the blood vessels in your lung a lot faster. So therefore, it's getting into your system really, really quickly. So you're going to feel a pretty immediate onset effect and then a pretty off or a pretty quick offset effect from smoking. So I just find that really fun. Like if I'm like going to go out with one's friends because I am I'm sorry. I'm so socially awkward. Like I need to live in. <laughs> Otherwise I'll go off and I need a little it. something for the anxiety, the social anxiety. So I'm like, I pop a joint before I go to see my friends. And I'm like, okay, I know exactly what I'm getting from it. Now with edibles, you will usually feel that within a 30 to 45 minute window of the onset, but the offset lasts quite a bit longer because it takes longer to go through your metabolism. So when you eat an edible, it has to actually go through your digestive system to be able to hit your bloodstream which is why it takes quite a bit longer. So highly, highly, highly suggest, you know, you ever hear that story where somebody's like, oh, I took the edible and an hour later I didn't feel it. So I ate more. And then 30 minutes later, I didn't feel it again. So I ate more. And then they end up like in the ER because they're so high three hours later because they didn't realize how long it took to actually get into their system. So like, I always say slow is pro. Really start with a low milligram to figure out how you feel and just don't take any more. Like if you're trying to go there to experience something, like make sure you're in a good space, know that you're not going to die and like really try to be intentional about how, what you're experiencing and how you're experiencing it. We have sublinguals, which you have this really large blood vessel underneath your tongue so that's another methodology of being able to take cannabis. You'll actually see tinctures. You drop it under your tongue. You hold it under there for 30 seconds and it absorbs into your bloodstream. So if you're looking for the fastest dosage, go for smokables. Something in between, go for a sublingual. Something that you're more comfortable with, like kind of writing out or experiencing, edibles. And that's also across the, the way of like what you're most comfortable with. Some people mm-hmm. are pretty comfortable with smoking and I totally honor that. And so when yeah, it smoking, comes to- Smoking does not sit well with me. I've, I've only tried a few times. Like I'm like- Are people say that? It just it's really so- doesn't sit well in the experience. And I'm just like, I think I'm dying with coughing. It's just the whole thing. I'm like, okay, this is not for me. For my girlfriends who are like, I'd like to smoke a little bit. I'm like, take a sip. Just take a little bit. 
And then you'll, and then you'll really start to feel. And I think what's, that's the beautiful part about so many is you get the actual plant profile because every cultivar is a little different. And I like to see like some cannabis cultivars, I'm like, they like to, I like to write a novel. Some of them I'm super creative and just like sit down and create something really beautiful. Or some of them I'm like, I could clean like crazy. Or some of them drop me into the couch and I don't want to move and I just want to watch a TV show for like four hours. So that's what I, that, that's the kind of cool part about flower it's very itself. Cool. Right? To, it's really to distinguish, great yeah, the different the different notes and experiences. I mean, I think the ones that I tried were like definitely the couch drop. And I'm like, why why am I wasting my whole day, you know, sitting on a couch? Absolutely. But I want to challenge people because there that's not always the case for everything. And that's where things like terpenes and cannabinoids come into play. Now, terpenes are the kind of sense and sm- like the sense and the flavors in food or in cannabis. So like when you smell a cannabis bud, I don't know if you ever have the opportunity to smell a cannabis bud, but sometimes it gets smell really cheesy or kind of like gassy. Those are the terpenes. And those particular molecules are basically like the cars that drive the feeling to your body. And so mm. certain terpenes have different feelings. So if you have something that's higher in mercine, the terpene, it's going to make you feel sleepier. If you have something higher in limonene, it's going to make you feel a little bit more uplifted. So the concept of sativa and indica is actually more of a myth. It's really based around the growing of the plant and the different plant structures rather than the actual experience. Now, more plants that are in the indica plant structure have the ability to make you feel more sleepy, but that's not the case for everything. It really depends on the terpenes and the cannabinoids found in that plant that help that make you feel the way you do. I so, really love that you're breaking this down and really yeah. that we're going into a lot of these ideals of the way that we think when we think of CBD or smoking or the different facets of this, I think it's important to open the conversation because these are things that I was like, wow, everybody's taking so many gummies. And like, I know I feel like crap when I smoke, like, why would I take a gummy? But hearing all the benefits, there's so many other reasons and so many other types that, to try. And it's worthwhile. And I think that's so cool that you're able to break that down for us. Absolutely. And I don't want anyone to feel super overwhelmed because they're like, oh, I should go find a gummy with this terpene in it. Or I want, I should find a gummy knowing exactly what the strain is. We like to call it a cultivar in a particular gummy, but the company should be doing that for you, which is why we created lifters, drifters, and shifters. And as we go and create more products in this industry, we're going to really fine tune these products specifically for people and their experience to be able to play with a lot more of those elements that are found in cannabis. So we're super excited to bring in more things like terpenes, other cannabinoids, other minor cannabinoids that are a little bit more functional for those experiences. It kind of brings a more scientific approach to cannabis rather than just smoking it because you were getting high with your friends in high school. Mm -hmm. It's now a it now can be a foundational part of your wellness journey because back to your endocannabinoid system, really bringing your body back to homeostasis and trying to find that perfect balance to be able to get you to where you want to feel in like in how you want to perform on a day to daily basis. I love that we're bringing the conversation back to wellness too, because you know, again, so many people are looking for resources in their day-to-day life. And as we know, different things work differently for different people. You and I have touched in on it. And so we're all drawn to different things, but I think that's why it's so beautiful to have this conversation and for you to share so much of your wealth of knowledge and your passion with us to be able to open this doorway and feel confident to sort of explore new areas of wellness and well-being for ourselves, you know, with a little bit more knowledge than than just the static of all the information out there. So Oh, I love this so much. I know we could go in so many different directions and you and I always, I feel like we can just sit and talk for hours. I look forward to that actually. I can't wait to to visit with you in person again and get to dive down all these rabbit holes. But to kind of wrap up the conversation, which I'm not wanting to, but I feel like for time-wise, we should probably wrap it up. But So first of all, tell everyone, where they can get in touch with you and connect with you. And I'll include this in the show notes as well. So Amazing. everyone keep there. Okay. So if you're interested in following Canvas and want to go on a journey with us, we are at Canvas Supply Co. C-A-N-V-A-S-T Supply Co. And if you are interested in learning more about cannabis, I would highly suggest 
looking at the endocannabinoid system because it'll take you on a journey to really understand how cannabinoids work with our body. That's E-N-D-O-C-A-N-N-A-B-I-N-O-I-D system. Good luck, Son. <laughs> but I think that's really a great place to start because it'll really help you start to figure out certain types of varieties of things that, that will work for you when you go down the, the pathways of um, different routes of healing. So Canvas Supply Co., we can find us on Instagram. We try to do a TikTok. It, I try. <laughs> um, you can also buy our products online and we can ship to most states, which is pretty amazing. And so yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. And actually really quickly to touch on the policy yeah. point. Yeah. The thing that's super fascinating that I think people don't necessarily realize is you can get Delta 9 THC shipped to your door legally. You can travel with it in airplanes as long as it is hemp derived. And back to that conversation about it, hemp is cannabis. You're getting the same quality of product. Now, maybe not necessarily and from like a medical standpoint, like we're not doing our extensive oil, which is like that cure all oil essentially for really big reasons. Um, because that's a hyper high concentration. But as long as the edible is below 0.3% THC, delta 9 THC in total weight, it's really based upon a dry weight basis. So again, sorry, I'm like bringing the conversation back up. I'll try to keep it short. But no, no, no. This is, this is such a valuable part of the conversation. So absolutely. yeah, please. I want people to feel comfortable. We also just passed a law in Tennessee to help protect the current program that we have here. So we put some standards into action, which will become law. So child proof packaging. So kiddos are not going to eat your gummies or try to get into your gummies. Um, certificates of analysis at certain processes of the um, manufacturing process and the end products. And then a uh, milligram cap, because we don't necessarily want everybody at a super high milligram when they're first trying something. And so there, the benefit to that is if you want a higher milligram, you just eat more gummies. But when it comes to somebody who's new, it's a little bit harder. I don't want to scare them away because essentially a microdose might be a really great experience for them, which is like a microdose is technically like 2.5 milligrams to start off with. If you want to try some gummies, we also have some what we like, call, like to call puffables. We have all sorts of variations on our website. That's canvassupplyco.com. Okay, we're going to link that. But I love that you circled back to the delivery and, and what that looks like because we forgot to touch in on that. So thank you for sharing that. Everyone can rest easy with their purchases and kind of knowing a bit more about that. But okay, so last question that I have for you today is I really want to ask you, you know, you're a new mom, you're running these different businesses, you're, you're farming. So you've got kind of a lot going on, but what's your wellness routine? Like, what do you really get into that helps keep you grounded and just living your life and enjoyment? I'm trying something new all the time. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, I love that. My wellness routine is a little psychotic at this moment, but the wellness routine that has always stuck with me and not to be that cliche person is cannabis. It's the thing that has been with me throughout some of my toughest times, through the times of me trying to even find a routine and enjoy working out. Even when I'm having a really hard day as a mom, like, I, I'll eat a gummy and I'm just like, I, my intentional play with my kid is just so much more in tune. If I'm having a distracted day, I think cannabis has this ability to really reshape your perspective of your day when you've had a rough one. And so for me, when it comes to my wellness routine, my mental health is the precursor to everything. My mental health is so much more important because if I'm mentally well, then my body can kind of fall in line and I can take care of myself physically. And so being able to use cannabis to kind of help get me back to where I need to be to relax. I don't always use it. I don't always need it. But it is a really wonderful tool to be able to recenter myself when I'm having a lot of distractions and a lot of stress in my life. I love it. Not only is it what you use in your life for your own well-being, but obviously it's your passion too, which is so beautiful because it really is full circle for you. And you're getting to share that passion with everyone now around you and now here in this community. And it's just so incredible to see. The second that I met you and you started talking about your passion, I was just blown away. I'm like, oh my gosh, you've got to come on the show. I cannot wait for everyone to hear all of the wisdom and intelligence that you have behind all of these different sectors. So thank you so much for joining us. It is thank such a pleasure. Yeah, it was such a beautiful, intentional conversation. Oh my gosh, I'll talk hours with you. <laughs> we let's let's schedule let's that because I cannot wait to hang out and talk hours. We should come out to the farm, so then we can actually like put our hands in the dirt. Let's and, like, do it. I need some good dirt time for sure. Yeah.
I am 100% going to take you up on that. Everyone, again, check out the show notes and you can find all the great ways to connect. And I'll see you soon. See you soon. Thank you.